Okay, great, Steve. Well, thank you very much for that excellent introduction. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the effects of drought and facilitating recovery from drought in California's montane and subalpine forests. I do want to very quickly here introduce my co-authors. You've already met Anna Marina as well as Steve. Uh, the two additional co-authors I have are Malcolm North and Eric Knapp, both very notable research ecologists here at the Pacific Southwest Research Station. I do have a lot of information I want to share with you in a relatively short period of time. I do want to expand a little and talk a little bit more about climate change and drought, their impacts on montane and subalpine forests in California, as well as on the stressors and disturbances that shape these important ecosystems over time, and then give you an idea as to what I think we might be able to do about it. I'm sure all of you recognize by now that the vast majority of the Earth's surface has warmed during the 20th and 21st century. Most of that warming has in fact been in the Northern Hemisphere at mid to high latitudes and often at mid to high elevations. And that's why you'll hear me argue that essentially we in Western North America are kind of ground zero for looking at the effects of climate change on natural systems over time is where we've observed some of the largest increases in temperature. The other point I like to make is that it's not only getting warmer, it's getting warmer faster than any time in recorded history. In fact, if you do the math now, since 2019 of the 20 warmest years on record have occurred, the exception being 1998. This is a table I pulled out of our contribution to the first edition of Climate Change and Global Public Health, where we were arguing at that point in time that 2010 was among the warmest. It was either the second warmest after 1998 or tied for the warmest with 2005, depending on which of these three primary data sets you use to analyze these types of relationships. Unfortunately for us, we published this in 2014 and then 2014 became known as the warmest year on record globally, followed by 2015, followed by 2016. A small departure to those trends in 2017 and 2018, the important distinction is that those occurred during a La Nina phase where we tend to see cooler than average sea surface temperatures, specifically in the Northern uh, Pacific. 2019 ended up being the second warmest year on record globally. So again, if you do the math here, the five warmest years on record have all occurred in the last five years. Get a lot of questions as to how 2020 is shaping up. We obviously have a few uh, months of data still to accumulate, but it looks very much like 2020 will either be the first or second warmest year on record globally. Those are observed changes. We also made projections of future changes in climate. On the left is some information that we published in the Journal of Forestry all the way back in 2013, but I would argue seems to be tracking very nicely. The left panel there is mean annual precipitation, right temperature, and this is 2050 compared to that climatic normal period of 1961 to 1990. And these are median change values based on 13 different GCMs. Unfortunately for us on the left there, you can see we're projecting further reductions in precipitation, somewhere on the order of five to 15%, and further increases in temperature, somewhere on the order of two to three degrees Celsius. Again, tracking very nicely with what Steve had mentioned earlier, specifically for the state of California. On the right, some data published by several colleagues of mine the very same year, where they're modeling what they call forest drought severity index, just the amount of drought stress in a forest environment. And as you can see here, their projections for mid-century are on par with what we observed in 2002. The important distinction there being is that that was a thousand year drought event where we saw large amounts of tree mortality in several different cover types throughout the Southwestern United States. I spent a lot of time in recent history working on the fourth national climate assessment for the United States. I will mention that we're just starting to put the teams together to execute the fifth national climate assessment, which is due in 2022. Uh, back on the fourth assessment, volume two was released in November 2018, and it looked at the impacts of observed changes and projected changes on different sectors and regions in the United States, and obviously the sector that I focused on 
belong to forests. And in that chapter, among other factors, we conclude that more frequent extreme weather events will increase the frequency and magnitude of severe ecological disturbances, driving rapid and often persistent changes of forest structure and function across large landscapes. That climate change and also climate variability will decrease the ability of many ecosystems to provide the important ecological goods and services that we've come to expect from them. And finally here that tree growth and carbon storage will be reduced in most locations by chronically higher temperatures, more frequent droughts and increases in disturbances. And obviously the two most important disturbances here in our Montana and subalpine forests are outbreaks of native bark beetles as depicted here on the left and high severity wildfire as depicted here on the right. I spent a lot of time working on bark beetles, a very large and diverse group. They're actually greater than 230 species in the state of California. Obviously, we tend to focus on a much smaller subset of that much larger group. And those are species that we consider to be economically important. That is under certain circumstances, like extended drought, they are capable of causing large amounts of tree mortality. And I would argue somewhere on the order of about eight or 10 species might meet that definition here in the state of California. We also tend to focus on the negative impacts of bark beetles on forests, but I do wanna stress that I'm talking about native organisms that under normal circumstances are really critical to the proper functioning of these ecosystems because they do things like regulate certain aspects of primary production, nutrient cycling, ecological succession, as well as the actual size distribution and abundance of forest trees. The example here on the right, this is the red turpentine beetle. That's the largest and most widely distributed bark beetle in North America, but it's generally not considered to be a, what we call a primary tree killing species. Climate change, obviously, as Steve mentioned, is having a big impact on bark beetles. These are poikothermic insects. Shifts in temperature and precipitation affect about everything in their life history. So for example, their fecundity and fitness, phenology and voltanism, the number of generations that they're actually able to produce per unit time. But not only the cells, predators, parasites, other competitors, symbionts within these systems. It also affects their ability to find and colonize hosts, obviously manifested through changes in host physiology over time. Again, very well documented for several different species here in Western North America. As a result of that, in general, we have seen elevated levels of tree mortality attributed to bark beetles of many of our different systems. And in fact, if I consider the data as a whole, I come up with four grand champions. These are bark beetle outbreaks of a magnitude and or extent we hadn't seen in recorded history. And so the first I have listed here is this very large mountain pine beetle outbreak that I'm sure many of you have heard through, uh, heard of really throughout most of Western North America, several different hosts involved, 27 million hectares have been impacted. To put that into perspective, that's an area larger than our 11 small states, South Carolina on down combined. Here the inciting factor, an increase in temperature, but specifically winter temperatures have allowed a higher portion of the population to survive the winter and contribute to the next generation. Uh, second one I have listed here is spruce beetle in South Central Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula, where that species was essentially responsible for killing all susceptible Lutz spruce. The inciting factor here, again, an increase in temperature, but more specifically summer temperatures have allowed a portion of that population to skip their facultative diapause, which results in them completing their life cycle in one year as opposed to two years. And you can imagine the implications of that to population dynamics over time. Much more closely to home, this very large Western pine beetle outbreak that just recently ended here in the central and southern Sierra Nevada on the order of about 150 million trees killed. Here the inciting factor of drought, but again, more specifically, as Steve mentioned, this interaction between elevated temperatures and reduction in precipitation. And then finally, a very similar story uh, throughout much of the desert Southwest, including California, where we had large amounts of tree mortality in our pinion pine component in the early 2000s, associated with that thousand year drought event 
that I mentioned earlier. Again, that inciting factor in interaction between elevated temperatures and reductions in precipitation. As I mentioned, drought is one of the most, most important and best recognized and citing factors, predisposing trees to colonization by bark beetles, well documented in the scientific literature for several of our different species here in the state of California. Short term deficiencies may result in recurrent infestations of limited scale, small pockets of trees being killed over time. Lo long term deficiencies may result in large amounts of tree mortality over extensive areas. And again, that's something we've witnessed in the central and southern Sierra in grand fashion in recent history. Why? Well, when soil water, soil moisture becomes limited, the tree really needs to make a very difficult decision. And that is how quickly and how much do they go about closing their stomates, these small apertures in the leaf that allow for exchange of, of uh, gas and water and, and um, into the leaf. And so in order to reduce water loss, you close those stomates, but the cost is that you're also preventing CO2 from entering the leaf. So depending on the duration of water stress, the intensity of water stress, trees may starve, uh, die outright from what we call carbon starvation. They may die from loss of hydraulic failure, um, small bubbles that cause cavitations in some of the vesicles. But generally before that, what we see is drought exacerbate other disturbances, particularly biotic agents, and bark beetles one, being one of the best examples here in our montane and subalpine forest. Just to give you an idea as to the impact they can have, we have a large network of, of plots on the landscape where we're looking at the effects of the recent western pine beetle outbreak on forests over time. This is just one of those plots, but I wanted to use it as an example to show you how quickly things can change in this system. 2019 on the left is when the outbreak began. 2016 is during peak levels of tree mortality. There was some additional tree mortality after 2016. But just to put this into perspective, back in 2014, there was about 500 trees per hectare. Today, about 150. 42 meters square per hectare of basal area. Today, about three. The forest was dominated by large diameter ponderosa pine. Now ponderosa pine is out of the equation and this stand is actually dominated by small diameter and since cedar as well as some canyon live oak. If you do the math here in a period of two years, we lost 70% of the trees and 93% of the basal area. All of the ponderosa pine were colonized and killed by Western pine beetle during that period of severe drought. Just very quickly as well, obviously there's this very important interaction between climate change and wildfire that is also influencing our montane and subalpine forests here in the state of California. We know that the frequency of large fires in the annual area burned is increasing and that by 2100 it could increase another two to six times from present. We've seen unfortunately a large lengthening of the wildfire season in certain areas up to about 80 days. And we're starting to perhaps acknowledge some shifts in fire severity as, as a result of climate change as well, although that's something we're having difficult teasing out, at least on a national level. Increasingly, the two are obviously interacting on our landscapes, and this is now being played out in grand fashion in reference to the Creek Fire there in the central Sierra Nevada. You can see this is data that I pulled back on, on October 12th. I just checked the data this morning. Now it's about uh, 362,000 acres, about 61% contained, occurring in an area of very heavy tree mortality as depicted here on the bottom right. So what can we do about it? My argument would be to first go to our chapter titled Managing Effects of Drought in California. Again, that appears in this recent general technical report titled Drought Impacts on U.S. Forests and Rangelands, Translating Science into Management Responses. The answer varies a little bit by ecosystem and we cover many of the ecosystems in California, but in general, we're attempting to shift systems back within the natural range of variability, including disturbances, and to facilitate transition to plant species better adapted to future droughts. And obviously with climate change, as you heard from Steve, this is particularly important here in the state of California, where we have a very large human population, about 42 million, the largest human population in the wild urban land interface, about 11 million, 
diverse natural resources and obviously large agricultural and forestry sectors at risk, as you heard earlier. Within that document, we have a very large table that uh, strategizes different methods for minimizing the undesirable effects of drought and facilitating recovery from drought within select California ecosystems. And here I'm just obviously showing you some of the data from montane and subalpine forests. First and foremost here, we would argue the importance of reducing stand densities of fuel loads through prescribed burning, managed wildfires, and mechanical thinning. Secondly, and something we often forget, is if you actually accomplish that, maintaining appropriate stand densities of fuel loads through the applications of those treatments over time, using topography and historic fire regimes to dry prescriptions, some uh, excellent resources there produced by Malcolm and, and some of his colleagues over the years, to increase forest heterogeneity, salvage dendine trees in areas of heavy tree mortality where that may be appropriate, plant drought tolerant species and genotypes in areas lacking adequate seed sources to rely on natural regeneration, particularly in areas where we've suffered very high levels of tree mortality. And then finally here we have prioritizing restoration of ecologically sensitive areas. Uh, Malcolm in, in collaboration with some of his scientists uh, colleagues would suggest to you that the best way to go about doing this is identifying large contiguous contigu contiguous areas to concentrate restoration and fuel reduction treatments, and then to turn over these treated fire sheds to the use of prescribed fire and managed wildfire for future maintenance. Many of us are now arguing to be effective. We're going to need to be managing more using wildfire in the future. So why isn't this happening on an appropriate scale? And I would argue that there's a very important social science component that has largely been ignored. And this is something I'm starting to work on uh, with several colleagues around, uh, my around the country and, and internationally as well, particularly several social scientists from Colorado State University. And here's just an example of one of our recent pub pu publications where we're looking at bark beetle disturbances in general using mountain pine beetle in the Intermountain West as kind of a model. And in the end, in that document, what we came up with was this conceptual framework, which would allows us to identify what's limiting our adaptive capacity. So on the left there, you can see we have the environment we're dealing with and the subcomponents are the stressor, exposure, as well as sensitivity of those environment. We would argue we have pretty good knowledge of all of these factors. On the right there, society and, and the subcomponents are impacts, public opinion, as well as management. And here in the end, when we went through this exercise for mountain pine beetle in the Intermountain West, we found the real crux to adaptive capacity here is, la is our lacking of fiscal and human capital, as well as a social license to do so in, in several areas. There is progress. You, many of you have probably heard about the recent memorandum of understanding signed between the state and the Forest Service, specifically the Pacific Southwest Research State, uh, Pacific Southwest Region. That has been uh, referred to as the Shared Stewardship Agreement. Among other factors, it, it, calls, it calls for prioritizing community safety, improving efficiency, coordinating land management, collaborating and innovating with all stakeholders. But perhaps most importantly, it calls for action, and that is treating over a million acres each year, uh, largely with prescribed fire and thinning. And just to give you an idea as to how effective these treatments can actually be, this is a recent paper uh, published by several colleagues of mine, where we looked at the impacts of thinning in two different types of thinnings, what we call a low variability and a high variability. The low variability just kind of being a very uniform thinning with a spacing about a half a crown width between the trees, the high variability thinning being trees singly or, or in groups of varying size and density interdispersed within small gaps, kind of trying to model that historic condition as, as best we can understand it. The thinnings were conducted in 2011, uh, the burns two years there later. Obviously this occurred during the time where we had this very historic drought to put that into perspective again, 2014 was the hottest and driest on record. 2015 was the second driest and third warmest. Um, and 2016 is when we saw the most 
bark beetle cause tree mortality. Here in these plots between 2014 and 2018, 27% of the trees died. We did see that the treatments were still effective in reducing tree mortality by about 70% compared to the control. We saw no difference in mortality between those two different thinning treatments, suggesting that leaving trees in variable spacing does not compromise growth or, resi or resistance of the stand. In terms of mortality in this system, it was most pronounced in white fir, followed by sugar pine, incense, cedar, and we only lost 10% of the ponderosa and Jeffrey pine. So very encouraging in that regard. Again, during a, essentially what's been now considered to be about a 1200 year drought event in many areas in the central and southern Sierra Nevada. Uh, best we can tell, this simply has to do with tree competition and that's depicted here. You know, the less, key tree, the less tree competition, the higher the growth and the lower mortality that was observed. Okay, in the interest of time, just wanna quickly transition and talk very little bit about tree planting um, because in areas of heavy tree mortality, we're likely going to be have to doing some of this if we're gonna keep forests in place over time. And there's an excellent tool, there's several of them out there, but this is one I came across and I've been playing with a little bit, the seed lot selection tool. And really what it does is kind of maps changes in climate over time. So I'd encourage you to take a look at this resource and consider it when making uh, decisions about planning in the future. And in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. And I'll leave you for my contact inf information. And please don't hesitate to contact me if I can be of any assistance to anyone. Thank you.